Good evening. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? I know I am. It's a good place to be. We're going to have a good time tonight. We're going to praise the Lord. Anybody got a reason to praise Him? It really doesn't matter if you have a reason or not. He's still worthy. Amen. I really think so. So I just looked over here and seen my old friend, Sister Sherry. Good to have you tonight. <laughs> oh, my. But uh, we got a we got a guest speaker tonight. And uh, would you just roll your eyes at me? Sister Diane is going to. I do. I can see what I'm not supposed to. I have trouble seeing. What, it's kind of like my ears. Sister Diane's going to be bringing us a testimony, her testimony tonight. And I, I told Brother, I guess her dad or son, one of them, I said, she invited all of her family to come hear her speak. She'll invite anybody to come hear me speak. But that's not true. It's not true. <laughs> I, God's done a great work for her, and I'm excited about hearing the whole story tonight. And uh, we're here to worship. We're here to praise Him. We're here to pray one for another that we might be healed. We've got a lot of needs tonight. Uh, and we're still praying for Sister Whitney. And... Um, they still haven't figured out what's wrong with her. God already knows what it is. And we're believing God to heal her. Uh, we want to remember my wife, continue to pray for her. Uh, Sister Ruby Norton, continue to pray for her. Sister Lana Apple, back there in the back. Uh, we're we're, we're going to believe that the next test they have, those spots are gone. Amen. God has no problem doing that. So uh, I was asked recently why God didn't heal every time we prayed. And I, I gave the most profound answer that I could think of. I don't know. But this I do know. He does heal. And we just got to trust him and believe him and keep praying. And so uh, real quickly, do you have a spoken need anywhere in this section? Sister Tammy. How about here? Sister Nikki. Connor. All right, let's remember Connor tonight as we pray. How about over here? Brother, Sister Pat, let's remember her. She's back in the hospital in Dardanelle. If you're over that way, go in and pray. Brother and Sister Ray, keep holding them up in prayer, especially him, that God will bring him out. Over here, Anna, Anna Hampton, amen. All right. Linda and Kelly, uh, any of you ladies? Get the number. I'll give you the number. Feel like feel like calling Kelly and encouraging her. Uh, my wife has only been. We've been just a, a couple months, and really with just this issue that she's having. But I can see where people in long-term sicknesses gets to needing encouragement. Amen. And I'm not soliciting encouragement. I, I thank God for all of you, all your prayers and calls. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what, they're much appreciated, and other people feel the same way, just like the pastor and, and wife does. So these people that have been battling like Kelly for a long time, uh, just a, a two-minute conversation on the phone can make a difference in their day. So let's let's pray, and not only pray, but let's, let's put a little work with our faith. Anyone else? Yeah, let's remember the Eppersons, both of them diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer, husband and wife, and Brother Linderbaugh, uh, not diagnosed with cancer, but having some physical issues. And uh, uh, as the Apostle Paul said, besides all this, the care of the church. And so let's hold that pastor up. Anyone else? Sister Gary Jacobs. Amen. 
I admire people that we pray for their loved ones last week, last service, and they request again because that just tells me, hey, we're trusting and we're believing God. We're turning to him for the answer here. Tom Garner. Turner, I'm sorry. Let's stand together tonight as we open this service with prayer. And I'll tell you, let's do something a little bit different tonight. Let's take a... The Bible says, where as many as two agree on earth is touching many things, but they shall ask the Father, it shall be done for them. Reach over to a neighbor, neighbor, take them by the hand. Let's agree together tonight for these needs, would you? Father, we come to you right now in the precious name of Jesus. We're grateful tonight, God, for the opportunity that we have. God, to bring before you tonight the names of our friends, our family, church members, Lord, loved ones of church members, whatever the case may be, we know that, God, you care. We know that you've already, Lord, paid the price, that with your stripes we were healed. Tonight in this room, there's people here whose names was called out to you. They're standing here tonight, God. They're believing you, Lord, for a good report. God, for your hand to touch them and minister to them. Lord, we pray that, God, in the midst of this service tonight, your anointing, God, would come up on each life and on each body tonight. Lord, that your virtue would flow through. and God, that you would lift them up. And, Lord, that you'll establish them tonight, God, in your healing power. Father, we pray for this service tonight. God, that it'll be a service, God, that is wholly given over to your glory, the purpose, God, of praise and of your wonderful name tonight lift your name and your kingdom up we pray that tonight men and women will receive Lord God from your word tonight receive Lord from the testimony God of your hand that is already Lord went forth ministering I pray that tonight in this house the discouraged will become encouraged uh, Lord those that are down and out will become uplifted God in your presence I pray that tonight God there will be chances of, 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 of people's lives Lord being turned around God, the, the circumstance, Lord, that they came to church with, well, they'll leave without tonight. And, Lord, we're going to give you praise for it, honor and glory in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. As they come to get ready to sing, I forgot to announce to you, my wife is doing, uh, the women are doing uh, concessions tonight. She said they have Bosco sticks uh, on the menu tonight. It's a new, a new uh, item. The kids don't know what it is. We eat them at church camp. This is what they make you look right here. Amen. But they are good. But uh, we come to worship the Lord first and foremost. How many tonight's glad you're a Christian? Born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Living by grace tonight. Amen. Our faith is in Him. He has established His kingdom. Amen. And His kingdom is within us. Amen. Let's give Him praise tonight. Well, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little life of heaven filled my soul. He bathed my heart in love, and he wrote my name up. Just a little talk to Jesus, baby.
already sung it, but I keep going back to that, that the whole time I've been singing. I just keep going back to just a little talk with Jesus. How many here tonight, you didn't, and, and don't, you don't intentionally come to church, but you have something that just seems to be just weighing you down in your mind. It's just hard to get in sometimes. How many of us, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us came tonight, we're, we're battling something. We're battling. I am. I'm battling physical stuff, but mentally, are we battling stuff? We're battling everyday life. We're battling the busyness of our schedules and our jobs and everything. But we've come to the house of God tonight. We can have a talk. We can have a talk with the one who can fix it all. Just a little talk. Sometimes a passing drear without a ray of cheer. Oh, but then a cloud of doubt. It hides the light of day. All those mists of sin, they rise. Then they hide our starry skies. Oh, but, but, just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Everything before the but no longer, no, no longer matters. Let's say that one more time. Because I know there's several of you here, here tonight. We're battling stuff mentally and physically. But remember this, sometimes the past seems dreary without a ray of cheer. And a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. All the mist of sin may rise, and it hides the starry skies. But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now this is the part we need to follow through with. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry. He'll answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer returning, you'll know that fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry. Jesus makes it right. Oh, said, let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faith is crime. Answer our invite. And when you feel a little prayer returning, you know a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Well, all right, all right, all right, all right. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Man, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It'll change. It'll change some of, some of the way you're thinking and your attitude about things. Amen. I'm, I'm telling you what, folks. If God ain't your hope, you don't have any. Amen. He is our hope. Our the Bible said He's a very present hope in the time or help in the time of trouble. 
Our ushers are going to come tonight to receive our evening offering. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to go out tonight and just a little bit further on the uh, doing things a, a little bit different tonight. This past Sunday night, we had our annual church business meeting. Brother Terry, uh, it was his year to rotate off the board for uh, a term. And um, we elected uh, Brother Randy Heffley as our uh, deacon uh, for the next four years. And tonight, we're going to ask him to stand and pray over the offer. While they're receiving the offering tonight, and may I say, I think it was—I it, know it's the first time and uh, it, that I could remember. And I think it happened to trustees once that we'd ever had two deacons that we had to vote on between two. We might have done it before, but I don't remember. We had two great candidates. We actually had four uh, people nominated. Great, great men that all had served on the board. But uh, God, we just have to trust God to direct in, in those circumstances. We welcome Brother Randy Moore. Done a great job the years he served prior to that. And, but we're going to have a testimony tonight while they're receiving the offer. I'm going to ask Sister Sherry Costa to testify. I admire this lady. Uh, I know you didn't come for that purpose tonight, but I tell you, she's been a trooper down through the years, faced a lot of adversity in her life, and God has brought her and just kept her through it all. But she'll tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Praise God. Somebody else got a testimony tonight. Want to share. We've got a testimony coming. And uh, matter of fact, I'm going to ask her to come. Oh, you got one over here? Yeah. Just dying if you want to go ahead and make your way on up. I hope it comes out right. Um, last Sunday, y'all prayed for my family and my granddaughter. Well, I want to give uh, the glory to God and to thank every one of y'all for y'all's prayers. We had a sweet visit with uh, our granddaughter in the hospital, and uh, she was laughing and, and had a good time, and she was released with um, uh, very hopeful uh, of her future, and I just want to give God the, the glory in this, for without this, we don't even know where she'd be right now. And I just want to thank every one of y'all for y'all continued prayer, because she will need um, therapy. And um, but God's got this. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, I'm going to introduce somebody that don't need an introduction, Sister Diane uh, Neiman tonight. And uh, many of you don't even know what she's been going through. But uh, is that notebook full? I've learned from the best. <laughs> Amen. I know Brother Jimmy has a lot of notes. But I'll tell you what tonight. We're go we're in. Uh, let just uh, enjoy tonight hearing what God is doing in this lady's life. We're thankful, and I know the seniors are as well. They, Brother Sam and Sister Diane stepped in and taken up uh, the position as, as senior citizen teachers, and uh, we appreciate them. Let's make her welcome tonight. Amen. As she comes. First of all, I can tell you that I am nervous as a cat. I have never met a stranger. I can talk to anybody, but this is totally, totally out of my little corner. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to give just a short testimony about my medical problems. But first of all, I'm just going to talk about other things too, because God has done so much in our life. Um, and I'm going to start when we were at camp meeting 17 years ago and Sam went to the altar. You've all heard that story, but, um, I was left sitting back there, and, and, and you feel like that everybody in the world is looking at you. And I, I sat there, and, I, and this lady came back and talked to me, and she said, don't you want to go? And I said, no. So um, a few, few minutes later, another lady came, and, you know, the same thing. I said, I'm fine. You know, I don't want to go. I just go away. Um, I didn't say that. That's what I thought. <laughs> 
And then, I th- then, then God really convicted me, and I thought, I'm going. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm gonna go make a change in my life, I'm going. And about that time, the devil said to me, I cannot believe you are going to be saved and you never took your kids to church. You never told them about Jesus. How can you do that? And I said, you're right, you're right. That's exact, I can't do it. How can I go and turn my life over to the Lord when my kids, when I'm, and I didn't do right with my kids. So I sat there a little bit longer and Brother Bull was up with Sam and, and I saw him, he, he was up at the front and he came around all the way to the back walked up to me from the back and all he said to me was your husband is very happy would you like to go see him and I said well yes I would <laughs> go figure so I walked I walked up there and I hugged Sam and he looked totally totally different and he was very happy and I do not remember how I got from hugging him to the altar but it was very quick and I, I, I say I got saved but that's not true I got saved when I was 11 years old I rededicated that night. Let me tell you, kids, when I was 11, I went to church all the time. When I was 15 or 16, I found a different group of friends. Friends mean everything. Went in a total different direction until I was 47 years old. That is so sad, but that is the way it goes. But, you know, that's just, that's just part of it. I've got stuff written down here. Because the devil has told me jillions and trillions of times that I don't have a testimony, and I said, Jesus is my testimony. And I said, I wrote all this down, so if I have to read it word for word, I will. I will not be defeated. And where Sister Faith? Where'd she go? There she is. She was going to sing Psalms 91. I'm going to tell you about that after a while, but she was going to sing a song tonight. She's lost her voice. She said, I'm so sorry. I said, that is only confirmation to me that he's trying to stop us, and it's not working. Not working. You know, when the devil told me that night, you know, you didn't raise your kids in church, blah, 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 he didn't go ahead and tell me what would happen if we did get saved. He didn't tell me that my kids would get in church. He didn't tell me that we would have grandkids that know nothing but church their whole entire life all they know is church now what if we had see he don't tell you the consequences he just tells you what he wants you to know but but we've got to just figure it out and stay ahead of him so now I'm going to get to talk about my grandkids we have a little boy back here his name is Elijah Samuel how could you go wrong with name Elijah Samuel and this is what this is what the, de- the devil never expected him to be this way, but he, since he was about three or four, he always wanted to say the blessing. E- every time we eat, we say the blessing, but, and Sam would usually say it, but he wanted to say it. So we turned him loose, and I don't know, if, I don't know what occasion it was, but he pr- prayed, Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for my family. Named his family one by one. Very good. So then he continued and he said, I thank you for my teacher. I thank you for my classmates. Name them one by one. I thank you for my neighbors. Oh, everybody in the neighborhood. <laughs> then we got to the pets. How wonderful is that? And so this year, he's eight now. This year he came and he, Sam said, Eli, you ready to say the blessing? And he said, I forgot something. He turned and ran away, and, and I asked his mother, I said, where's he going? She said, he has a list of things he is thankful for because he doesn't want to forget anything. Oh Hello. <laughs> Abby, she's back here. She's 15 and a half. <laughs> if there was ever a girl who is mission, has a heart for missions, it's her. She went to her first mission, I guess about two years ago, was it? She came back and I've never seen her more excited. She had pictures, she had stories. She loves kids and kids love her. Um, But she had a good time there and after that she had gone to some retreats 
and about, I don't know, six months ago, she told me, she said, I'm going to be a neonatal nurse. And I said, that's wonderful, Abby. You can do anything you want to do. You can, you can do anything. You make good grades. And so then about three months after that, she said, I'm going to be a marine biologist. I said, that's wonderful. You know, you can do anything. And then she went to a, her church retreat, and it was in July, very hot. She was sitting under a tree. She said, no wind was blowing, Grandma. And all of a sudden, I felt this wind. And I thought, yes. The next thing she said to me was, I'm going to Hendrix College, and I'm going to be in youth ministry. <laughs> Devil didn't tell me that. Didn't tell me that was going to happen. So then, now we're down to little Connor, little white-haired Connor. <laughs> Love that precious baby. And he's, he's just, he's 13 months old. Um, but he has a voice, a big voice, and he thinks he can sing. And his daddy sings in church, so I'm assuming the Lord is going to use him to sing in church. Then we have Madeline, that's his sister, and they live in, that's our Georgia babies. Um, they, they um, we don't get to see them very much, but we love them, love them dearly. But Madeline, uh, in, I guess it was in June, we've talked to her about the Lord since birth. I mean, we have just talked to her about Jesus, and of course, her, Brandy and Chad are in church, that's all she knows. But she, the phone, when the phone rings at 11 o'clock and you know it's your daughter's ringtone from Georgia, you think, oh my, what has happened? And Madeline said, Grandma, I got saved tonight. And so she'd, she'd been to the, this is the thing, she'd, she'd been to the altar several times, but she said, you know, I'll know when I'm saved, and I'm not going to say I am if I'm not. And I said, that is a wonderful plan. Anyway, she said, I'm saved, I'm saved. And I said, well, how do you feel? And she said, I could jump over a bridge. I know if I had a bridge, I could jump over it. She was so excited. And I said, what is that noise? And she said, this was 12 o'clock in Georgia, in a, in a Baptist church. She said, they're shouting. She said, my mom has just been shouting for the longest time. <laughs> so then when we talk about Madeline, this is my next, this is my next little thing. Um, I worked for hospice for five years. And I had all the patients that I really needed. And one day when I was at a patient's home, um, a nurse was there and she said, she said, we've got a man that um, is just really hateful. And she said, he, he's just about gone through all of our AIDS. She said, he won't let them stay. He, th he throws them out and, and when they do stay, he's so mean that they just cry and leave on their own. And she said, would you consider taking him? And I said, well, I've, I've got a full load. I really don't want another one. Conviction set in after that. And about two days later, the director called me and she said, can you go? And I said, yes. He was in the nursing home. I go to the, the nursing home and they told me, they said, you know, he's, he's pretty, he's pretty, he, he didn't, he didn't talk dirty. He was just mean. So I, before I went in, I said, Lord, you know how I am. You know, I want to go in there. He had, he had had a heart attack, and he was on hospice. Um, and I said, you know how I am, and I'm going to want to go in there and just tell him he needs to be saved. You know, I just, you're going to have to put your hand on my mouth. So I was pretty sure that he would. And so I knocked on the door, and this big, booming voice says, go away. And I said, okay, Lord, here we go. So I went in. And I said, hello, my name is Dinah. And he said, get out. And I said, well, I, I probably could, but can we talk just a minute? And he said, what? And I said, do you understand that this is, my, this is what I do for a living? This is my job and that I make money doing this. This is how I make money. And, and if I come here, which I drove 30 miles to get here. He was in Russellville. We lived at Solo. I said, I drove 30 miles to get here. And... <laughs> Do you understand that if you send me home that I'm not going to get paid today? And he said, all right. So I thought, yes. So I, ke I kept talking to him, and he was still, he was just hateful. And his name was, and I've got permission from his family. In fact, she was going to be here tonight, but she couldn't. Um, his name was Lucian Charette. And I said, Lucian Charette? I said, that's a different name. And I said, where are you from? And he said, it's French. And I said, oh, I said, can you speak French? French and he said well of course and I said okay I said say something to me and he said well you wouldn't understand it and I said how do you know I might speak French so he rambled something off Lord only knows what he said to me uh, 
<laughs> but I said, I said, okay. That, I said, oh, that was beautiful. He said, what did I say? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't speak French. <laughs> he tried so hard not to like me. And he kept saying, I don't like you. I don't even like you. And I said, okay. And one time he told me to shut up. So I just went down and sat at the end of his bed like this and just stared at him. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm shutting up. You said shut up. And he said, oh. you know, I'm sure he'd never seen anybody quite like me before. I left that day. And I said, okay, we have decisions to make. Do you want me to come back tomorrow? And he said, not really, but I guess you can. Yes. So I came back the next day, and we had several days. Every time I left a, a person, a patient, I would say, I'd never said goodbye. I would say, see you in the morning. So that day I said, see you in the morning. He stared at me. The next day I got there, and I was talking to him, and he said, and I was just, everything he said, I would just come right back at him with something nice. And he looked at me, and he said, are you for real? And I said, well, yes. And I believe I am. And he said, what are you doing? He said, why are you being so nice to me? And I said, because I love you. And he said, nobody loves me. Nobody even likes me. And I said, do you think there might be a reason for that? And he, he just, he looked at me, and we just kept talking, and, and he, he just kept saying just horrible things. I just kept being nice to him, and he, he looked at me, and he said, are you crazy? And I said, some say, depends on who you ask. And he said, I have never seen anybody like you. He said, you're different. You're, you're just different. And I said, well, is that good or bad? And I really didn't want to know the answer to that, and I don't think he ever told me, but uh, Brandy, our daughter, had had Madeline, and I think Madeline was about three weeks old. Um, you can go ahead and put the pictures up. He, uh, Brandy told me, she said, she called me, and she said, I'm, I'm on my way home. She'd been with us because she had the baby. And she said, I'm going to go home, and I want to come by. And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> you know what he is going to do. So she, she came, and she knocked on the door, and I opened the door, and he said to her, go away and she said hello <laughs> she's kind of like her mother <laughs> and but when she got close to the bed and he saw the baby he said what do you have there and she said I have a baby and he said she took the blanket off and he said oh a baby oh my goodness is it a boy or a girl she had on yellow and she said it's a girl and he said oh a baby and she said do you want to hold her and he said yes he, t he took her and he held her and he Brandy put her up over his shoulder and he just loved her. Go ahead and put the next one up. This is my favorite one. He held her for the longest time and after they left the first nice thing he said to me was thank you for letting me see your grandbaby. And so I left that day and I said see you tomorrow see you in the morning and he, he didn't say anything he just looked at me. Um, so I knew that the Lord had softened his heart and that he was going to be receptive. So the next morning I went in just as soon as I got there and I sat on, went over and sat on his bed and I said, Mr. Charette, I said, I have to ask you, if you died right now, where would you go, heaven or hell? And he said, hell. And I said, do you want to go to hell? And he said, no. And I said, well, then why? why do you say that? And he said, because I have to. And I said, why? And he said, because, because I don't have a choice. Because I've done such bad things. And I explained to him, it doesn't matter what you've done up until this point. It matters what you do from this point on. But up until now, it doesn't matter. And he said, he said I don't think you understand. He said, I, I, I've just done horrible, horrible things. And I have no doubt that he had. Um, but I said, do you want to be saved? And tears was running down his face. And he said, yes. I led him in the Lord's Prayer. And that is the most rewarding thing that you can do anywhere. So that day when I left, I said, see you in the morning. And he said, see you in the morning. So I had a, I had a few more days with him. And we talked. And he told me, this is what he said, that he had two sisters that had prayed for him his entire life. Don't you ever think that prayers will not work. Rhonda, 
a nursing home is not too far for somebody to go, and the Lord will send them. If he will use a three-week-old baby, he can do anything. He is all-powerful. Anyway, I, I read the Bible to him that day, and the next day um, I went, and we were, um, we, we were talking again, and I read to him, and it was... Um, it was in John, and I didn't even pay attention. In my father's house are many mansions. If I were, if it were not true, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Read him that. Read him the whole thing. Never dawning upon me of what was just about to happen. And when I left, I said, "I'll see you in the morning." And he said, "I love you. Goodbye." went out the door I knew I would never see him here again but I will see him and I, I was going home and I got in the car and I cried I didn't cry because he was dying I cried because it was such a short time it was there wasn't much time in there for him to be saved and I thought you know time, time is nothing to God I mean he 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 just took care of everything but it just all fell into place but he and he was fine when I left he was he was fine I got, I went through Hector, got past the bridge, turned up to the boss place. I was right there and the phone rings and it's his stepson and he said, Diana, you might want to come back. He said, he's, he's, if, you wanna, if you wanna say goodbye, you might want to come back. And I said, I've already said, I've already said goodbye, so this is your family's time. So he called me back in just a little bit and he said he was gone. That's how quickly it happened. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of time. So, you know, that, that hope that you're always talking about, it's there. That hope is in everything that we do and say. This, this next thing I'm going to talk about, it was when we went to see the, the leaves at Harrison. I don't know what, it was 2014, I guess. And right before that, Sam was a uh, veteran service officer in Russellville, and I was in his office, and I was just sitting there, and the, you know how the Lord just, out of the blue tells you something and he said Psalms 91 and I said yeah I've read that it's, I bet it's good I don't remember exactly what it says but you know I bet it's good um, and he, he said again Psalms 91 so I told Sam I said I've got to go is your Bible in the car and he said yes so I went to the car I got the Bible and I came back and I started reading it he said write it down and keep it with you I said okay so I told Sam, I said, I've got to write it down. So I went over to the computer, and I was looking at that and looking back and trying to, trying to write. And Sam said, let me have the Bible. I'll read it to you, and you, you type it down. So I did. Two pages here. I've had it for that long. It wasn't long after that that Sam, um, his eye, he had a problem with his retina. And I thought it was for that. And it was. It helped that because we read it right before he went in. But this was actually for me later. Isn't it amazing what he does? Takes care of every little detail. So after that, and I don't know how long it was, Tony Burroughs was here in the revival. And he called for people that needed to be healed. And I went. I had been so, not really sick, but tired. Just like every step I t took was like, climbing stairs I mean I was tired I knew something was wrong I thought something was wrong anyway I was over here and Tanessa Pruitt was praying behind me and she was praying in tongues and the thing about it is she was the only one around that I that I heard anyway she was just really praying in tongues the thing about it is I knew what she said I knew that I needed to go to the doctor because I was sick so that's that I made an appointment. I went down to get blood work. And I, I, I had melanoma cancer when I was, um, it was 2005. So every year, every six months, I had to go to the doctor and have blood tests done. Every year, I never, ever checked my lab results. But every six months, I would go and I would get a letter saying everything's fine. So I thought, okay. So this time when I went and had the blood work done, I didn't get a letter. And I waited a couple of weeks, and I didn't get a letter. I thought, well, I will just take myself to medical records and look at my own results. 
So that's what I did. And when I saw the results, I'm not medical in, in any form, but when something says abnormal, 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 low, 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 I thought, thank you, Lord, that's why I'm here. So I called and made an appointment with the doctor, and he comes in, and he, he didn't have them in his possessions, but I had mine, and so I handed them to him, and I said, I need you to tell me the results of this blood work. And he, he looked at it, and he said, it's fine, everything's fine, handed it back to me. I said, no, everything is not fine. I handed it back to him. He said, he looked at it again, and he said, yeah, he said, everything is good. Handed it back to me. I handed it back to him. I said, everything is not good. There's some, there, and I, there was a word, and I don't even know what it is now. But I said, look at that. Is that right? Is that normal? And he looked at it, and he said, well, that is a little low. He said, well, and after a little discussion that we had, he decided to run tests. Um, probably to get me out of his office, I, just a wild guess. Um, so when he ran the test, he said, I expect all of this to be negative and, uh, and everything will be okay, but you know, just, we'll, we'll just go ahead and do this. And I said, okay. So he did it and when they got the results back, I went medical records again and got my copy and the pathologist was saying all these things that it could be with the blood work that I had, it could be this, this or this. I brought it to these two and brother Jimmy said, those are big words. I don't understand any of them. I said, I've looked them all up, and they're all bad. <laughs> Every one of them are bad. So um, I, had to, I had to do that. And then he said, okay. He said, we're going to do another round of tests. And he said, um, well, I if these are all negative, then you're going to have to have a bone marrow biopsy. And I said, a bone marrow biopsy? Last week there was nothing wrong. Now I'm going to have to have a bone marrow biopsy. He said, that, that's right. He said, you're going to have to have one if these are negative. So they came back negative, negative, negative. So he, he called me to come in, and Sam went with me, and he was telling us that, um, you know, all these tests were negative, so I was going to have to have a bone marrow test. And I said, what do you think I have with the testing? And he said, I think you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he said, you're going to have to have the bone marrow biopsy. And we, Sam and I had already talked about it, and Sam said, well, we want her to go to Little Rock. And, and he said, no, that'd be very difficult. So I said, okay, we've had just a lot to take in today. We're just going to go home and think about this, and we'll get, we'll get back to you. So I went home. I went home, and a week later, they called. His nurse called, and she said, the doctor says you're going to have to have a bone marrow biopsy. And I said, I know. And she said, well, and I said, I'm going to have one. I'm, go I'm going to Little Rock. And she said, well, where are you going? I said, I don't know. And she said, what doctor are you seeing? I said, I don't know. I don't know yet. But I know I'm going to Little Rock to get the testing done. So she said, okay. So that, and a week later, I still didn't know. And I, and I kept telling the Lord, you know, I don't know what to do. I mean, it's not like I can call an office and say, hello, this is Dinah Neiman. I need a bone marrow biopsy. Just <laughs> write me down. You can't do that. So anyway, I, I waited and I waited. Nothing. So I, I, t I thought, you know what? The doctor thinks I have lymphoma. That's fine. I, I mean, I took that really good, and I'm usually pretty aggressive. Um, and I thought, I'll just, I'll just wait. I'll just wait until you tell me what to do. You gave me this. Gave me Psalms 91. I'm trusting in. That's what you said to do. Trusting you. No pestilence is going to come near me. You, I, I already know all that, so I'm just going to wait. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I woke up, and he said two words to me, and I don't know if they're here or not. And I asked him if I could say his name. He said, Ken Partain. I thought, Ken Partain, yes. He knows Dr. Westbrook, UAMS. That's where I'm going. So when Sam woke up, I was so excited, and I said, we're going to Little Rock. We're going to the UAMS. And he looked at me like, how do you know that? So anyway, we called Kenny. We went to his office, and um, he, I told him, I told him, I took my test results, and I told him what I said, the Lord said to give it to you. And he said, he picked up his cell phone, dialed a number, put it on speaker, Dr. Westbrook, one of the top doctors at UAMS. Uh, he's an oncologist, he's a surgeon. And so Kenny said, I've got a really good friend, and he said, she's got some blood work that looks pretty bad. And he said, well, you know, sometimes 
blood work looks bad and it's not. He said, I'm not in the office today. He said, he said fax it to me. So Ann faxed it to him and he faxed it to the office. And he, he told Kenny, he said, I will go in the office tomorrow and if it's anything that I'm concerned about, I'll call, I'll, I'll call. So the next morning about 8.30, he called and he said, um, your blood work uh, needs to be, we need to, we need to do some talking. And I said, okay. And he said, there's some things that's not right. And he said, I need you to come down and uh, we, we need to go over it. And I said, okay. So that's what I did. And when I went to his office, he, he told me, he said, I'm a surgeon, but I can get anything in this hospital that you need. So we're gonna start doing testing. He did all kinds of blood work. He did, he did three CAT scans. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I promise you, we will not stop until we find what's wrong. And I thought, thank you, Lord. See, the Lord knows what he's doing. He, he knows what he's doing. So we had all that done. And um, then I, then I went to the, got to the bone marrow test. And Dr. Westbrook said, usually by now with blood work like yours, we have found something really bad. But he said, as soon as your, your test results come back, he said, I'll call you. So it was, I don't know, two, three days. They do most of the stuff there. He called him, he said, I've got good news and bad news. What do you want first? And I said, good news. And he said, I have to write, he said, you have no myeloma, you have no leukemia, and you have no lymphoma. The, the bone marrow biopsy evidently tells them if you have cancer anywhere in your body, and it tells them what stage it's in. So he said, okay, that's the good news. The bad news is, we still don't know what is wrong with you. I don't know. And he said, I have talked to the director of oncology and she's just as baffled as I am. We don't know, but, but we're gonna send you to Dr. Montwani and she will dig until she finds it. So we came back and went to Dr. Montwani. She had a, um, was he an intern? No, he was a doctor of some sort. Anyway, he was telling me, he said, he said well, do you know about antibodies? And I said, not really. And he said, well, do you want to know? And I said, yeah, might as well. So he was telling me, and everybody may know this. I, I didn't know it. Your antibodies, they, when you have a germ, they fight. And there's certain ones that fight certain things. And some of them, if they, if they have trouble, then they'll call up other antibodies and they'll all fight together. Well, my antibodies weren't participating in any of this. So she said, she said, I, I need you to go see Dr. Kennedy. She said, he's an allergist, immunologist, and he, he will help you. And I thought, okay. I mean, they, <laughs> whoa. So we went to him, and he came in the office, and he said, I know exactly what is wrong with you. And I said, praise God. You know, somebody knows what's wrong with me. I said, okay, what is it? He said, CVID, common variable immune deficiency. And I said, okay. And he said, it's a very rare disease, like one in 28,000. So not a lot of people have it. Um, but he said, I, I know all about it. And he said, you need, um, we're gonna, he, he said, first of all, I just wanna tell you, there is no cure. There is no cure for what you have, but it is treatable. And I said, okay. And he said, what we do is, they take a thousand people's blood they spin it down, they take the antibodies out, and they put it in a little bag, and you, you get an infusion. And he said, you, ha you have to have, you do not have a choice, you have to have this. He said, the only choice you have is, do you want to come down for like six to eight hours and have an IV in your arm and stay at the hospital until this does this, or do you want to try a brand new medicine and, and you put the needle into your stomach and you do it that way, but it only takes two hours. And I said, I don't know, that's too much information. Just, I'll just have to think about it. So he said, okay, and um, the thing about it is, m Medicare, I, I was 65 in August, Medicare came into effect on August the 1st. On August the 5th is when they started all my testing. Tell me God's not in that. Um, and he said, there is one, one little thing, he said, um, these treatments, he said, they're kind of pricey, and I thought, oh my, you know, they may be five or six hundred dollars a month. I said, how much are they? And he said, ten thousand dollars a treatment. And I said, okay, so I'm going to have these treatments, and and after two or three, then my antibodies are going to be happy, and everything's going to be good. And he said, no, your antibodies 
are not ever going to be happy because you don't have that many. Um, but he said, "There's just there, you're, that's just all you can do. We we can't do anything else." And he said, <coughs> "I said, okay, so so how long do I have to have these treatments every four weeks?" And he said, "For life." So you know you got to do what you got to do. This right here, I made I made these, and I. I can't keep ahead. In this church, I've been giving them out. There's so many sick people, I can't stay up. It says, you don't know how strong you are until being strong is the only choice you have. Um, so anyway, I, I, I didn't have a choice, so I thought, okay, that's good. So he said, what we're going to do, he said, he said Medicare kind of drags their feet, and it may be two, three months before you can get started on this because, you know, you have to be at a certain point. And he said, the low that Medicare approves, you are two variables below the low. So he said, that won't be a problem. But he said, we have to do a shot, and I have to look, pneumonia, tetanus, and whooping cough. We give you a shot, we send you to the lab, we wait five weeks, you come back, and we see just how many antibodies you have, who's working and who's not. And I said, okay. So we did that, and we left Little Rock, and we came home. At two o'clock the next morning, I was throwing up, sicker than a dog, because I'd had a reaction to the shot. Um, and he, he called me and he said, the, the testing is, has stopped. And I said, why? And he said, you have no response. Zero response. You have no immune system. He said, he looked at me and he said, do not get pneumonia. <laughs> I said, sounds like a plan. Um, he, said, he said, how many times have you had pneumonia? And I said, this is, with CVID, this is just common. He said, how many times have you had pneumonia? I said, never. He said, okay, how many times have you had sinusitis? I said, no, I don't even have colds. And there was one more thing, do you remember? Ear infection, ear infection. He said, how many times have you had recurrent ear infections? I said, never had an ear infection in my life. And they're thinking that I could have been born with this or I could have gotten it later. But I know, I know for the past 10 years, I've had this problem because I, I just know I do. Um, so, you know, the Lord, so good. Anyway, so they, they stopped that, and within two weeks, I was zipping, I zipped through Medicare, and I had my infusions, and we went to, the, went to UAMS. And we get down there, and this nurse, she said, I've been a nurse for 33 years, but the medicine, that he t again, he told me that I had, he, I had no choice, that I had to take the new medicine because I, I, with the reaction that I had to the shot, there's no way I could use the other. So she said, I I've been an infusion nurse for a long, long time. I've never used this medicine, and I've never used this medicine sub-Q, which means put it in your stomach. So she said, basically, you're a guinea pig. And I said, fine with me and, but I could tell she was a Christian within the first five minutes I could tell she was a Christian every place you look down there it says healing hands through the grace of God you know everything they did I knew I was right exactly where I needed to be but before I had this infusion um, Sam and I it was two days after I had my diagnosis and we were at Walmart and <laughs> he has only one eye but he sees really well um, there was a shopping cart sitting way across the parking lot. And he said, there's a cell phone in there. And I said, you're kidding me. And I went over there and got it. And my first thought was, take it in. And my mind, I, and I thought, well, no. If I take it in there, then they're, they're probably going to change shifts. And she's going to come in, because I knew it was a girl's, because it looked fancy. Um, I said, she's going to come in, and it's, they're going to be, I, I'm just going to take it home. And he said, well, that's good, because she'll call. She'll call. So about 2 or 3 o'clock that afternoon, my phone rang. Sweet little voice on the other end. And we talked for a minute. And I said, um, do you want to meet to get your cell phone? I asked her where she lived. She said, Shaquilla. So I said, okay. I said, do you know where this is? No. I said, do you know where this is? No. Leonard's? Yes. She knew where Leonard's was. <laughs> Everybody knows where Leonard's is. So we, we go to Leonard's. We, we pull up. And it's starting to mist. And she told me what she's going to drive in a little red car. So she, they were pulled this way. She was driving. Her husband was on the passenger side. Sam was driving. And, I, and so I, we pulled up to the car, and I put my window down, and I was intending to hand him the phone. Well, 
when I started to do that, the Lord said, get out of the car. And I thought, okay. So I got out, and she got out, and we went to the front of her car. And she said, first of all, she thanked me for getting her, bringing her cell phone back. And she said, um, I don't want to offend you, but I have a question. And I said, okay. And she said, do you believe in God? And I said, yes. She said, I know that you are sick. She said, I don't know if you have cancer, but I know what you have is very serious. She said, can I pray for you and give you a word from God? And I said, yes. We stood there in Leonard's parking lot with her praying for me, and it was encouragement. This is two days after I diagnosed and before I started on the infusions, which he was just telling me, I'm here, I'm with you, I've never left you, not to worry. So we, we prayed, and of course her husband was in the car, and Sam was in the car, and I went to the window, and I said, and it was starting to rain then. I went to the window, and I told Sam, I said, get my cell phone, you got to take our picture. And he said, it's raining. I know he thought, some random person you don't even know, and you're, <laughs> you're, you're out here in the rain, and you want me to take her, your picture? So, he, of course, being the good husband he is, he got out, and he took her picture. And she's here tonight. <laughs> Bless her heart. What, what if, and I, and I asked her, we met at the park and talked for three hours there or two after that, and I said, okay, what if I had, I had just handed that phone off and we had dashed off? She said, I would have followed you. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered where you went. She said, I had a message for you, and I was going to give it to you. And she's, she's timid. I mean, she, she's a timid little girl. Um, this is just about all I have, but I do have to brag on my husband. We have been married um, for 45 and a half years. And when we got married, if anybody ever said, your husband will take care of you if you are sick, I'd have never imagined it. But he has. There, there, was, there has been times when I could not get off the couch, literally. I could not get up. And he was always just right there. He has been trained to do the infusions. I'm not quite sure about that yet but um we're we're not on we're not on our own just exactly yet we have one more visit with the nurse and then he's you think your job is <laughs> i mean this has a i mean it's an IV, iv thing in your house and it's got a pump and it's it's just i don't know but anyway he says he can do it so we'll see um <laughs> You have a certain amount of time after you start it that you've got to finish it. So if everything goes well, we'll be fine. Otherwise, we'll be calling, I don't know who, uh, the Lord. <laughs> anyway, with all that, I just, I just hope that people can understand how powerful our God is. There is nothing that he can't do. And, you know, I, I know people wonder why didn't you get healed? I don't know that. I have never, I have never said, why me? Why do I have this? Never said it. I, I've never doubted anything that was done. And you know what? Whatever I have to do to feel better is good. And when I went to the doctor this two weeks ago, he, um, he did some blood tests, but he said, now, the real results won't be until March. But he said, um, you know, you're, you're probably not going to see much effects of it. But I tell you, I got my blood results, and I was here is low. Before, I was just on the, just bottomed out. Now, I'm halfway up to low, and I feel wonderful. I have energy that I never felt in years. But Sister Laquita, you preached that night, and you said you need to praise the Lord whether you feel like it or not. And you talked about that today. That is so true. There is so many times that I could have stayed home, and I would drag to the door. And I remember Sister Mary, I mean, I would just get dizzy and just, just get sick. Um, but every time, without fail, when I pulled myself out of the seat and stood up and started praising the Lord, I felt so much better so much better. There's something to praise. Huh? Yeah. 
Wow. That was great. Sister Diane's so hard to read. Uh, this has been in a pro process for three months. Oh, four. That you've been going to testify? And every time she'd say, not ready yet. Not ready yet. And so tonight I, I came. I didn't know if she was good or not. And uh, so I had a word. I, was, I, was, I just found something I was going to read and encourage you. But as we're sitting there, I felt faith being challenged in this house. I, I was hearing something that some of you need to hear. I need to hear from time to time. <clears throat> as she was um, talking about hearing God say, hearing God, this is what God said. This is what God said. And I thought, you couldn't preach a sermon anymore with any more inspiration than the testimony we've heard tonight. To know that God knows where we're at at all points in our life is worth everything. And I, I think that some of you are going through some things tonight that the Holy Spirit is using Sister Diane's testimony to let you know, know right where you're at, and nothing's impossible to me. He'll he'll put people like the young lady in in your path. He'll put you in people's path. So tonight, I'm not going to add to what she said. We're going to take an opportunity tonight to pray and pray for your needs, where you're at. Is there anybody in this room that needs encouraged tonight? Well, we had a few ladies. We got some men in here that need encouraged. God, he wants to do it. We just got to let him. I'm going to ask you that want him, you just need encouragement, need God to move in your behalf, whatever it may be. I want you to come tonight, and we're going to pray for you. We're going to believe God. I, I, and I'm telling you, I, I don't know about you, but I received from what she said tonight. Sister Diane, that was awesome. I, I mean, I wish I could preach like that being nervous. That was just God speaking to this congregation. I thought of a song as she was talking tonight. I thought of that song, that chorus we sang, He Knows My Name. He knows where I'm at, knows what I'm going through. There's not anything that taken him by surprise. And we'll give you just a few minutes tonight, a few, few moments to come if you want to come. Anybody else going through circumstances that's overwhelming? Sister Diane has been sharing with Brother Jimmy and, uh, and keeping us up to date. And there, there's a lot more she could say of how uh, that really, really demonstrates how faithful God is in this situation. But she has done a great job of, of, of giving us that information tonight to know. Anyone else? I'm going to address these eight people up here. There's probably more in this room. But I'm going to tell you God knows right where you're at. I'm going to tell you that he's no respecter of person. What he is doing in the Neiman's home, he can do in yours. God can put and will put people in your path that will help you and lift you up and carry you, help carry you through your time that you're going through. I want you to take <clears throat> just about another step forward because we're going to give people room to get behind you. I said this year was going to be a year when God challenges the church to be a community of believers, people that love one another, that pray one for another, that hold each other up in times of, of trouble and sorrow and all those things that we face. We're going to embrace 
each one of these people tonight. We're going to pray for them because God's faithful. And we're going to believe God to move in their behalf and whatever's going on in their life. I don't know how I don't have to know the particulars God does. But I want you to come tonight. I want you to find you somebody. Could we just spread out a little bit? You that are up here, just Sister Lon, if you'll go about in front of that altar and leave about three foot between you or whatever. That way we can kind of circle you. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray for God's peace. That peace Brother Doug taught about this morning that comes from above. Peace that's not bought at a, a convenience store. It's not gotten at a retail store. It's peace that comes by the Spirit of God. We're going to pray that God's healing hand come upon you, mind, soul, body, tonight, and spirit. Let God begin that healing in your life right now. We're, going to, we're just going to trust Him. Are you going to trust Him tonight? Let me tell you, God has already earned our trust, demonstrated it. I know that's a bad choice of words, but he's already proven himself time and time again. Amen. Find you somebody right now. Get around them. Amen. And we're, gonna, we're just going to love on them. We're going to pray for them. We're going to anoint them with oil, as the Word of God says. We're going to pray the prayer of faith. We're going to spend some time tonight praying for these needs. Thank you. 